Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and God bless you all. Put it closer. Okay. If you say so. Uh, we'll be reading from the New Testament Scripture, Galatians 5, verses 22 to 26. Life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they are in conflict with each other so that you may not do you are not to do whatever you want but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality impurity debauchery idolatry and witchcraft hatred discord jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, 
Let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Amen. You may be seated for the announcements. So July came early <laughs> today. Um, so next week, we'll make sure we'll have the water and everything ready, which is not quite ready for this hot, hot weather. Um, because of that, we will not have a meal after the service as well. The building will continue to get hotter. And of course, next weekend, we will be here for Memorial Day, but we will not have a meal after the service on Memorial Day. So June 5th, uh, two weeks from today is Pentecost Sunday. We are a Pentecostal church, so we will be celebrating. And after this service, we will have a meal. If you would like to bring a dish, you would like to do, um, prepare something, please let us know, and we will start to get that ready. Um, Otis and I will be away um, starting this afternoon through um, next Saturday. We will be here next Sunday. However, if you do need us for anything, we are only an hour and a half away. We're going pretty local. Please reach out, get, send us a text, and we'll make sure that somebody um, is able to attend to anything or that we can help in any way we can. Um, that being said, we still have family night Friday night. So Say is, um, unfortunately she is sick this morning, but she was ready to talk to you all this morning because we, she does need help on Sat, um, Friday night. So Friday night will be one of our last uh, family nights for this school year as we come to the end of our school year. It will be a game night. It will be outside um, because the gym is going undergoing reconstruction starting on Thursday. So we will be outside um, celebrating and having games. So if you can help Say, um, please give her a call this week let her know. Um, Otis and I just, we needed a break um, just so we can get ready for the summer, all the ministry that's coming up ahead. Amen? So bring your friends, if you're kids, bring all your friends, come on out. Um, and we, um, the first Friday of the month of June, we will be meeting for prayer from 5 to 8. We'll pray for a couple of hours here from the Word, and then we will fellowship together around a meal. And, and everyone is invited to that. And then I'll let you know what else June is happening. Uh, we do have our big school family celebration coming up. We are very blessed that Greater Exodus um, on Broad and Sp um, Fairmount has allowed us to use their building. So that will be Thursday, I believe Thursday, June 16th. Both school buildings will be coming together. They have air conditioning. And uh, we, we definitely needed a larger place because the children at Highway, we needed to accommodate them since there's no um, sanctuary right now at highway for their graduation so i think that's it prayer team please keep praying on the 5th of june as well after the meal we will be talking about the retreat how you can get ready the things that we'll be doing what our schedule looks like so um, i believe we have everyone signed up if you have not signed up for the retreat and you still want to go please see me today um, because i can squeeze you in don't tell fatima but i'll squeeze you in all right thanks Well, praise the Lord. You guys remember what I said about today being a great day to be in God's house? Turns out all our streams are down today. So um, when that happens, so you, yeah, you put a great day to be here. But when that happens, we do record the service, and I will post it later. Um, doesn't apply to anybody here, but if you have friends and family who are just dying to see what happens at that church you go to, you can let them know that we are going to uh, post it up later. Um, all right, so as usual, we have uh, offering baskets in the front. Um, one of the disciplines of the church is the discipline of giving. This is something that we as a church need, but we as individuals need to uh, be faithful to God in this way. You know, the Lord says that if you are faithful in little, you will be entrusted with much. And um, one of the ways that we show that we are believers is that we obey God's word. So thank you so much for your faithfulness and obedience. You can give um, in one of the offering trays. You can also go to give.reslife.us. Um, or you can text to give 215-309-9092 and of course the app if you have not downloaded the app um, I think pretty much everybody here has done so based on the numbers of downloads that we've gotten all right so let's look at the Word of God today amen I want to start with a little bit about temptation and I think we're all familiar with this quote about temptation. According to the internet, it was said by Oscar Wilde, I can resist everything except temptation. And when I read this quote, it kind of makes me giggle because 
It was about 30 years ago when I was a young Sunday school teacher and I was preparing a lesson. God made something very clear to me, and that is this. God doesn't want you to resist temptation. All right? If you look in the Bible, that is not the biblical path. God does not tell us to resist temptation. No, rather, God tells us that we are to run away from temptation. All right? So what does the Bible say? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But when it comes to temptation, flee the evil desires of your youth, run away from them. All right? Um, If this thing would advance. Jesus, when he taught us how to pray, said, lead us not into temptation. Go another way. Take another path. Don't go where temptation is. And when you are tempted, God will provide a way out so that you can escape it. So we don't stand up. We don't resist temptation. We um, run away from temptation. That's the biblical course. So if you think about it, resist the devil. You know, it's like that school bully. I never dealt with a school bully like this, but I've always heard that if you give in to a school bully, then he's going to figure you're an easy target and he's going to keep on attacking you. But if you stand up to that bully, again, I never stood up to any bully, so I don't know if this is true, then he's going to find somebody else to mess with because he's going to say, you know what, that guy's it's just not worth my time. There's got to be an easier mark out there. So resist the devil the way that you would resist a bully. But when it comes to temptation, temptation isn't a bully. Temptation is like a strawberry trifle. So let's say that You have to walk by this bakery on your way to the bus every day, on your way to work every day, and their specialty is the strawberry trifle. But you're trying to be good. You're trying to cut back on your sugar. You're trying to cut back on your carbs. You're trying to, you know, eat healthily. Um, So when you walk by there, you take a look at it, and you say, you know what, strawberry trifle? I'm stronger than you. I'm going to stand up to you. I'm going to resist you. And then you go on your way to work. But the thing is, that strawberry trifle isn't going anywhere. That strawberry trifle is not going to go away. So when you're on your way back from work, I'm stronger than you, strawberry trifle. I'm stronger than you, right? We talk ourselves out of it, and then we go on our way. Next day, we're going to work again. Guess what? Brand new strawberry trifle right there in the window. Same thing. I'm stronger than you, strawberry trifle. You're not going to get me. I'm stronger than you are, okay? I'm going to resist you. I'm going to resist you. But that strawberry trifle isn't going to flee. It's not going to run away. And then it turns out you have a really bad day at work, right? Your bus was late, your boss gets mad at you, you have a fight with one of your coworkers, and there's like this weird growth on your neck, and everything's going poorly. And then you're on your way home, and you walk past the bakery, and you're thinking, you know what? Why not? Why not? Everything else is going wrong today. I deserve that strawberry trifle. So we let ourselves in, and we go in and get that strawberry trifle, right? That's why it doesn't work to resist temptation. So what should, and her name is Tina, according to the, one of the stock characters available in PowerPoint. What should T- Tina with the Y, it's like T-I-Y-N-A, not that it matters, but anyway. What should Tina have done there? Tina should have found another route to get to work. She should have run away from that strawberry trifle. Because you can stand up for that, to that strawberry trifle so many times, but guess what? It's not going anywhere, all right? So we need to go away. We need to run away from it. Um, Solomon, when he's writing to his sons about an adulterous woman, he said, keep to a path far from her. Don't go where temptation is. Don't put yourself in situations where you know that you're going to be tempted. So a little bit more about temptation. Um, Where does temptation come from? Well, temptation decidedly does not come from God, and that's what James tells us. Not from God. When we are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And thank you, Christina, so much. I'm sorry I didn't get those handouts out earlier, um, but I think we're just at the the fill-in-the-blank parts at this point. So no one should say that God is tempting me. When we are tempted, temptation does not come from God. Temptation does not necessarily come from the devil. What is the next thing that James says there? James says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. All right, so sometimes that, you know, like the horror movies, the call's coming from inside the building. That temptation comes from us. And then sometimes... Right? It's not necessarily the devil. It's not necessarily our flesh that tempts us as well. We do get tempted by Satan. Remember Jesus? I don't know what's wrong with this remote today. Jesus was led into this, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, and the footnote there is to, or to be tested by the devil. 
So there is temptation, there is testing that comes from the flesh. There's also temptation that comes from the devil. Really not all that important to find out, you know, if that strawberry trifle is tempting me, is it the devil's bakery or is it just my own flesh that's tempting me? Really the important thing is how we respond to temptation, not where it comes from. And again, not to uh, blame God for our temptations. I remember I had a roommate who said, you know, um, when I was in college, he said, you know, I used to say, well, God, you created me with these urges, so what am I supposed to do? No, that temptation doesn't come from God. That temptation comes from within us, or it comes from um, the devil. When does temptation come? Temptation comes when we are vulnerable. So we just read about the fact that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Um, and when was this? This was after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. So temptation comes to us when we are at our weakness. Uh, if you guys remember the Karate Kid movie, right? Sweep the leg, you know, go and attack the vulnerable part. Go and attack the person where the person is vulnerable. And I think it's important to notice, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was preparing for ministry. He was in fasting and prayer. We can be doing the right thing and still be vulnerable. You know, I know that the teachers who pour themselves out every day in this building are very vulnerable. They're very tired. They're very exhausted. It's very difficult work. It's not as though they are looking for temptation, but they are vulnerable and they need to be on their guard. So when does it come? It comes when we are vulnerable. When do, uh, when, I'm sorry, it also comes when we are isolated. Brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being um, separated from you for a short time in person, though not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find about your faith. I was in afraid that somehow, in some way, the tempter had tempted you. So what is Paul saying? He had planted this church in Thessalonica. He hadn't been, Thessalonica, sorry. He hadn't been able to visit it. And he was saying, I was afraid that since you were isolated, the tempter had come in and tempted you in some way. Now remember, if you remember the book of Galatians, Galatians talks about the fact, hey, I can't believe that so quickly after I left, you guys fell into a, a false doctrine, a false gospel. And what I'm saying here is, when we are isolated, when we separate ourselves from the fellowship. Right? It's very important for us to get together on Sundays and on Friday nights and whenever the church is open, but it's also important for us to make sure that we are hanging out with people who know the Word of God. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have friends, we'll get to that a little bit later, um, in the world, but we need to make sure that we are in fellowship with people who can build us up, who can strengthen us, so that we are less likely to be tempted. If the only influences that we are getting are the influences of this world, we are making ourselves extremely vulnerable. And then when are we, uh, when does temptation come? Temptation comes when we are indulging the flesh. So the story um, there is when um, the woman came and anointed Jesus' feet with an alabaster jar of perfume, very famous story, and Judas said, they could have sold this and made a whole lot of money and give it to the poor. And John points out he didn't say it because he cared about the poor. He said that because he was in charge of the treasury and he used to help himself. He, he used to help himself to those things. And later on we see the Bible tells us that um, when, Jesus, when, when Judas took the bread at the, uh, at the Last Supper, Satan entered into him. All right. So when we are living our lifestyle, when we are indulging our flesh, when we are indulging the things of our body, then we are subject to temptation. The tempter comes to us when we put ourselves, make ourselves vulnerable in that way. So we're going to be looking today about self-control. Self-control is one of our, that, that shield that they have there is our shield against temptation. We need to develop this fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. And can I just say, this doesn't have anything to do with the lesson. You know, we talked about love, joy, and peace really kind of upset, not upset, really just a little disappointed that we didn't get to the next fruit of the Spirit, which is one of my favorite, which is the spirit of forbearance, you know, the spirit of being able to hold back. But um, they're all good, so maybe sometime in the future we'll do a study on forbearance, but don't sleep on forbearance. All right, so self-control, get back to the lesson. Uh, models of self-control, and we'll go through this very quickly. So, um, Again, this is directly from the book, and I encourage you to read the entire story from the book, but I think we're all familiar with the story of Samson from Judges chapter one, verse, um, 16, verses 1 through 21. So this was a bad example of self-control. And this is a pattern that we see in uh, Samson and Delilah's relationship. Delilah says, what's the secret of your uh, great strength? And he says, oh, try tying me up with uh, seven cords. Next morning he wakes up, he's tied in seven cords, he rips them off, and he goes and defeats the Philistines. 
She says, hey, that wasn't it. What's the secret of your great strength? And he says, well, I wish I could figure out the secret of the strength of it. No, just kidding. Um, if you tie me up with fresh cords that have never been used, then I'll be able to be subdued. Next morning he wakes up, he's tied with seven fresh cords, he breaks them off, and he defeats the Philistines. So the next morning she says, hey, how can you keep lying to me? What's the secret to your great strength? He says, well, if you tie all of the braid, my braids into a loom, you know, um, I'll be as weak as any man. Next morning he wakes up, his braids have been tied into a loom. At this point it's not really a coincidence, is it? Right? You would think that there was something going on. And yet what happened? Three times he resisted, just the same way that, you know, three times Tina resisted that strawberry trifle. But the fourth time, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. And so he told her. Right? Even after everything he told her happened to him, he told her the actual secret because he was sick of being nagged to death. He was sick of walking by that bakery and getting tempted by that and not partaking of it. So he made a stupid choice. All right? Samson should have run away. And if we think, it's not really reasonable to expect me to run away from a relationship or something that's really important to me, let's look at Joseph, all right? Joseph is a model, a good model of self-control. And if you remember, Joseph was sold into slavery. He was bought by Potiphar, who was the captain of the, uh, the Pharaoh's guards. Potiphar's wife saw that he was really good looking. And so she said, come to bed with me. And she said that every day. And then one day they were alone in the house and um, she, said, hey, come to bed with me, and she grabbed him by the cloak, and he ran out of there. He left his cloak behind him. Now, he knew that there were going to be serious repercussions for what he did, but he ran away. That was a smart move. Okay? He didn't say, I've resisted her all this time. I'm strong enough to resist. You know what? Maybe he was, but he was not going to find out because he ran away. I will tell you, I might very well have an alcohol addiction. I believe that there was some alcohol addiction in my family. But I'm never going to find out. You know why? Because I stay far away from alcohol. I'm not going to put myself in that situation, in that circumstance where I am tempted. It's so much wiser for me just to run away. I have a great deal of respect for Giovanni for the fact that, you know, he's saying he saw the way that the kids around him were going, and he decided to separate himself from that. He decided that he needed to get back to the church because that's where the wise move is. We need to separate ourselves, right? And that's the, the best thing that we can do in those circumstances. We have to say, I can go to the left or I can go to the right. I'm going to go the way that God has called me to do. All right. We're going to spend a little bit more time on point three, which is the how-tos. All right, and again, this is the third point in uh, chapter 24, if you're reading along with us. So how do we exercise self-control? How do we stand up to temptation? Well, the first thing we need to do, as we've been saying, is flee. And remember what Jesus said. He says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So what are the things that we are supposed to cut off? I don't know that we literally need to cut off our right hands, but you know, what Jesus is saying is, hey, if it's either that or not going to heaven, cut off your right hand. And I, I can't really blame him for that. But here's some things that we might find it a little bit more difficult to cut off. If your friends are causing you to sin, cut them off. You've got to run away from them. You have to separate yourself from them. Now, be very, I, I want to be very careful about what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we should not associate with people who aren't Christians, who don't believe the th same way that we did. First of all, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. And second, we are here precisely to be evangelists to people who don't know God, and we can't do that if we don't know any people who don't know God. But what I'm saying is, again, if I have a problem with alcohol, if I used to run with all my old friends who used to go to bars and do all that sort of carousing and thing, and they're still doing that, and I'm saying, well, that's the only way that I can be friends with them, right? I've got to go where they are. I've got to go to the bars where they are. Or if they're texting me and saying, hey, I just had this margarita last night, and it was just amazing. It's just mind-blowing, right? That's going to be an influence on me. Or if I'm seeing their posts on Facebook and all the things that they're saying about that, no, I need to get away from that relationship. Yes, I want to save people who are drowning, but that doesn't mean if somebody jumps in the water in the ocean and there's an undertow and I don't know how to swim, I better go and jump there in there with him in case he gets in trouble, right? I'm going to drown myself. What am I going to do? I'm going to call a lifeguard. I'm going to you know, get a lifeline and throw it out there. I'm going to get a life preserver or something. There are ways that we can minister to our unsaved friends, but if they are going to drag us back into our old lifestyle, we need to cut them off the way that we would cut off our right hand. All right? Sometimes we need to cut off our job, and sometimes that's a step of faith. We don't know what our source of income is going to be, but if we are in a place where we have to compromise, where we have to um, 
make decisions that are contrary to the word of God or if we are constantly being made to choose between am I going to go to fellowship with in the church or am I going to, uh, to go to my, to my job? Am I going to go make that money? You know, it's very easy once you get into that cycle. I can get overtime on Sunday. I can get some work done on Sunday. I can get things cleaned up on Sunday. It's very easy to fall into that cycle. And sometimes we need to realize this, bil- this job isn't healthy for my relationship with God. If it's going to cause me to fall into temptation, then I need to run away. All right. Thank you, brother. What about our hobbies? If there's something that takes more time, or takes my money, or takes my attention, or takes my love, I need to cut it out. I need to let it go. And I, I'm sure you heard me talk about this because I complain about it all the time. You know, Christians who come up to me and they say, is it okay for Christians to watch baseball? Is it okay for Christians to have a coin collection? Is it okay for Christians to do this and do that? And usually it's more esoteric than that, you know? Or I know Christians who do that, and they seem to be okay with it. And if, if that's the way that we're thinking about our Christian life, we have totally missed the point of our relationship. So when Candace and I first got married, I had subscription seats to the New York Philharmonic. I had great seats. 11th row, like almost, I used to tell people, if I could choose any seat in the building, I would have chosen the one right next to mine. That's, that's how good my seats were. And I used to love, I used to look forward to Friday nights. And then Candace and I got married, and I gave up those seats. Now, I could say that it wasn't a sacrifice, but that's just stupid. It was a sacrifice, right? But it wasn't a hard decision. Why? Because my relationship with Candace means a whole lot more to me than being able to sit and see the New York Philharmonic, right? And we have to recognize that this is the choice that we're making. It's like the choice of the rich young ruler when God came to him. He came to God and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now look at what he asked him. Look at what's in the balance, eternal life. And Jesus said, sell everything that you own. And he went away sad. There was everything he owned and there was eternal life. And he made a stupid decision because he was very rich. And we think it's a stupid decision until God comes to us and God says, Otis, I want you to stop watching tennis. I'm saying, I can watch tennis and still do what God wants me to do and still be a good Christian. No, if God tells me that that's the one thing that I have to give up, then it's going to affect my relationship. I could still have had a relationship with Candace if I had decided to hold on to to those tickets. But the relationship would have been an awful lot weaker. And at some point, push was going to come to shove. Now, I'm you know, we committed to each other, we would never break our vows, but it was going to impact our relationship. And we try to, you know, make exceptions and go around things and say, oh yeah, other Christians do that, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if God comes to you and says, you need to choose, we need to make sure that we're choosing wisely. And guess what? If God hasn't done that to you yet, he's going to, because that's just the way that we are as humans. We allow things to get important in our lives. And then when God tells us what what we need to do and we say no, we are choosing who is God in our lives. We are saying, I'm the one who gets to choose what happens in my life. You're God for certain things, but when it ultimately comes down to it, I'm the one who needs to choose. So if God hasn't come to you and said, this is the one thing you need, the way that he said to the rich young ruler, it's coming. And even if God has come to you, be on your guard because other things have a way of slipping in and coming in. We need to make sure that when Jesus says, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to get rid of, that you're not holding anything back. Abraham, right, didn't hold back his son. He was willing to do whatever God asked him to do. And that's the attitude that we have to have, whatever it is. It's not a question of, well, God, there's nothing wrong with this. Well, God, other Christians do it. No, if this is impacting our relationship, if Jesus says no, we need to say no. And then related to that, I I just do this in because it's just so prevalent in our society today. Um, we need to cut off some forms of entertainment, right? Maybe instead of having a smartphone, we need to go back to a dumb phone because there are too many distractions, there are too many things that we can get to. Maybe we need to put parental controls on our cable and on our internet because there are too many things that we can, you know, get involved with that aren't helping us, that are leading us to temptation. And I'll tell you something else. Has anybody ever get caught in that YouTube loop you know, I've been watching a lot of political stuff on YouTube, and as soon as I finished, it's like, hey, here's another video for you. Hey, here's another video for you. Nothing wrong with those videos, right? I'm not watching anything that's um, hurting my spiritual life, but all of a sudden, I've spent an hour just sitting in front of the computer looking at stupid videos. Well, 
I need to control that. I need to watch my entertainment because that's time that I'm not spending with my family. That's time I'm not spending with the Lord. That's time I'm not spending with the Bible. That's time that I'm just spending entertaining myself. Now, granted, we all need those times of entertainment, but we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we're putting our limits on those. And if we can't put limits on those, we need to cut them out of our lives. We need to let them go. But it's not just a question of what we flee. It's a question of what we pursue. So when Paul writes to Timothy, flee the evil desires of youth, he talks about pursue faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So it's not just the things that we turn our back on, but it's the things that we, put our, we allow into our lives instead. So um, self-control isn't just about what we avoid. It is equally about what we pursue. So uh, it's a hot... Sunday afternoon, I'm going to go back to my food metaphor, right? Let's say that I decide I'm going to get all this junk food out of my life. So I come in with the snow plow, and boom, it's gone. Boom, it's gone. There it goes. Now, what if I don't replace it with anything? And I say, okay, no more junk food in the house. Gee, I'm kind of hungry right now. I got to find something to eat. And here's the thing. I don't know whether you notice about this. You know, there's a, a poppy store right across the street. We live right around the corner from uh, a Rite Aid, a couple of poppy stores, right? It's very easy to find stuff that's bad for you. A whole lot more difficult to get healthy food. You have to make a plan to get healthy food. And remember what Jesus said. He said, when a demon is cast out of somebody and the whole, you know, brain is, is kept, swept clean, that demon comes out with seven more demons and makes it even worse than it was before. Why? Because there was an empty space. So it's not just a question of, I'm going to get rid of all those things, right? We need to make sure that we are filling it with faith, with the Word of God, with fellowship, with things that are going to build us up. Because either those things that we were struggling with before are going to come back with a vengeance, or we're going to find something else. You know, we're not just going to sit around and twiddle our thumbs, all right? And again, temptation isn't just something that comes from within, but we have an enemy who wants to see us fail. So the best defense against, you know, those times when we're bored, those times when we're vulnerable, is making sure that we are filling ourselves with things that are productive. We're filling ourselves with the Word of God. We're filling ourselves with ministry. You know, we're spreading God's word. We're talking to people about the word of God. Um, not just a question of what we avoid. It is equally about the things that we pursue. All right. The third how-to, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. So the next thing that we need to do is come near. We need to make sure that we are moving. So this is us. We're in the middle and the devil's on the left. Jesus is on the right. Yeah, Jesus is on the right side. And if you notice, we're not really in the middle. Right? We are born into sin. Our tendency is to gravitate towards that left side. And the closer we get to that left side, the harder it is for that right side to pull us. That's the way magnets work, right? As we get closer to one, its pull on us gets stronger. And as we get farther away from it, its pull on us gets, gets farther away. So what we need to do you know, we resist the devil, and he flees from us, and we come near to God. And what does James say? And God comes near to us. If we make that effort, God is going to meet us more than halfway. And when we are under God's influence, it's a whole lot harder for the rest of, that, those, rest of those influences to affect us, to impact us. All right, so we need to, again, we need to make sure that we are watching the circles that we are moving in. We need to be where the Spirit of God is. We need to be in the Word of God because the Word of God is living and active. We need to be in the house of God where other people are lifting up God's name and praising God's name. We need to be moving in Christian circles, and we need to be praying in the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can strengthen us and keep us as well. All right, and that's actually our next point, the Holy Spirit. Um, so... How do we do this? We have to rely. I was trying to keep it into one word, um, verbs, sentences, but didn't quite work out. So this is the last one, a little bit awkward. Um, but we need to rely. What does that mean? This is the difference between Christianity and pretty much every other major religion, every other religion that I know of. Every religion that I know of, other than Christianity, is about human effort. Try harder, be as good as you can. If you're good enough, then maybe you'll earn what you know, uh, uh, an eternal reward. But God recognizes that we don't have that ability. 
And he doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to rely on him. And that's one of the hardest things for us to do as human beings because we think, I'm not worthy and I have to earn it. When in fact is, I'm not worthy, I need to have faith in the grace God gives me. By grace you are saved through faith, nothing else. Grace plus faith and nothing else. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that anyone can boast. So look what uh, Peter says. His divine power has given us everything that we need, so we rely on the Holy Spirit. And second, this one is near and dear to my heart. He has given us these great and precious promises. Rely on the word of God. How many times in your daily regular devotions have you read something and, you know, may have been a verse that you've read all your life and all of a sudden it hits exactly what you were going through, exactly the question that you were asking, exactly the thing that you were struggling with? Because God brings the word, the Holy Spirit brings the word of God alive. He can only do that if we have it hidden in our hearts or if we're, and if we are regularly filling ourselves with the word of God. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of remaining in God's word. Two of the best tools that we have are that prayer relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, please seek the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Um, but even if you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got the Spirit of God living inside you because that's what he promises when, he, when you accept him as your Savior. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Recognize that you can't do it by yourself. And then rely on the Word of God. Stay in the Word of God because that is your strength. That is your bulwark. I have hidden your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. All right, and then press on. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 11. And we're going to go through these um, bit by bit in these next couple of points. So the first thing is press on. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Okay, so what is Peter telling us? Peter is basically telling us that if we are not going forward, we're going backwards. All right? So if you're swimming in the ocean and the current is against you, you're not standing still. Right? If you're just treading water, you're going to be pulled away from the shore. In order just to stand still, you have to keep going, actively swimming against the current. And that's what Peter is saying, that if we possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive. All right? If we aren't moving forward, then what does he say? We're nearsighted and blind, forgetting that we've been cleansed from our past sins. So that is the Christian walk. We can't say, you know what, God? I did it. This is as holy as I want to be. I'm going to stay here and wait till you come for me, right? It doesn't work that way because we are being pulled by the tide the opposite direction. As long as we are trying, as, uh, when we reach that point where we're, where we're comfortable, where we're standing still, where we're safe, that's the point where we start to slip away. We're swimming against the current. And we have to keep pressing on, keep pushing on against it. And then the final point, persevere. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And isn't that what this is all about? We want to see God. We want him to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We don't want to see God and have him say, Whew, Otis made it. Uh, I, it was, it was kind of tough there. I was a little worried there for a second, but thank God you made it. Yeah, it's great just skate in. I mean, you're still going to spend eternity with God, but how much better, you know, when you see God in all of his glory to think, I didn't live for myself. I didn't disappoint you. I persevered. I stayed on. Even when it was difficult, I exercised that self-control so that I could hear that well done. It's wonderful to know God, isn't it? It's wonderful that he's patient with us. It's wonderful that he called us, that he redeems us, and that he keeps us. And I always go back to what Peter said. Um, remember that it is not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life, passed down from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of God, a lamb without spot or blemish. And when we think about the investment that Jesus had in us, what is our response other than to exercise self-control, other than to let go of those things which aren't like him? God has so much invested in us because we love him, or because he loved us. And if we love him, we should be living for him and not for ourselves. Amen? 
I don't live for myself as much as I live for Candace. Candace doesn't live for herself as much as she lives for me. We both live for our daughter because we love them. We love her. And that's the relationship God wants with us, not what can I do, what can I get away with and still make it into heaven, but God, I want to live my life to please you. I want you to be able to say well done when you see me. Amen? Lord, we do thank you for the great and precious promises that are in your word. We thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. And we thank you, Father, that you love us enough to correct us when we are wrong. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to examine ourselves, that we would look at our lives, the things that are important. And most of all, that we would listen to you, that we would know when you were speaking to us, when you were convicting us by your word, when you were convicting us by other believers, and when you are convicting us by your Holy Spirit. And that when we hear your voice, Father, that we would let go of the things of this world, let go of the things that could lead us astray. Father, help us to flee those things. Help us, Father, to cling to you, draw closer to you, so that we may walk in victory for the glory of your name and for the glory of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Oh, yes, my God. All right. Thank you, Candace, for reminding me. Um, this was a, a bit of a difficult week, if, if you don't mind my saying, for Christina's family. Um, her uh, cousin's son passed away at age 10, 10 and a half, and uh, we were at the, at the funeral on Friday. It was, it was a wonderful ceremony, but it's just something that, you know, I, I can't even imagine that as a parent having to go through that. And uh, Christina just wanted to say a few words and share her testimony, so Christina, please come forward. It's yeah, so a Friday. Okay, good night, everybody. Friday, um, June, uh, May tw 20th, my cousin had to bury with her son at the age of 10 years old from an asthma attack. And we had to attend a funeral for him. We had a celebration for him, music and food. It, it was just real nice to celebrate his life for 10 years. And I, 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 I want to read something. It says, God saw you getting tired. God saw you getting tired, and the cure was. The cure was not meant to was not meant to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, "Come to me," with tearful eyes. He watched you as you slowly slipped away, and thought we loved. And the, oh, sorry. With, uh, and, and whisper, come to me with tearful eyes. We watched you as you slowly slipped away, and though we loved you dearly, we couldn't make you stay. Your golden heart stopped beating, your tired hands put to rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. We love you, Tyre, my you. So, you know, it's saying like, um, let's celebrate love and celebrate each other. And just, you know, just go, forget family, family that you met at, go to them and hug them, because that's what I did. So they had been my family like a, a while ago. I was married to my Aunt Lisa. So at the cemetery, they said, go hug, go around and hug somebody. So we all hugged, we all hugged. We all heard that family we was mad at, and I go back to the um, the Met. I, I hugged my aunt Lisa, and I said, "I'm sorry." And so sometimes you gotta just apologize to those family members to be mad at, and life is too short to be mad. So that's all. And let's continue to pray for Christina's family. Um, they've got a long road <laughs> ahead. And um, we can be part of the healing by just being present with our prayers. Amen. So the benediction this morning is from Jude, verses 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
and go in peace today. Thank you for joining us. Um, if anybody has any questions about the upcoming events, come and see me or Otis or just want to um, talk about or receive prayer, we're here this morning and we're, we're going to stay around for a while, but we will not have a meal. Just a little hot, okay? And, uh, and I forgot to say this. If anybody, you know, we, we had baptism and membership last week. Wasn't that great, right? There's still room. You know, family doesn't have to stay a certain size, right? So if anybody still wants to be baptized, become a member, let us know. We'll, we'll schedule something in a couple weeks, and we'll celebrate again, right? Because that is what healthy growth means. Amen. All right. All right, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>